Without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's guests. Charles Small is the director, president, and founder of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy at Yale University, and is the director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, which is the first university-based research center on antisemitism in North America. He has taught in the departments of sociology and geography at the University of London, Ben-Gurion University in Barsheva, Israel, Tel Aviv University, and the Institute of Urban Studies at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He has lectured internationally on globalization and national identity, sociocultural policy, and racisms, including anti-Semitism. Brett Stevens writes the Wall Street Journal's Global View column on foreign affairs. He is a member of the journal's editorial board, is the 2008 winner of the Eric Brandel Award for Excellence in Journalism, is the former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, and has reported on stories from Iraq, Egypt, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Lebanon, among other places. In 2004, Mr. Stevens was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, and we are very honored to have him both here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Brett Stevens and Charles Small. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, just to give you a preview of what we're going to try to do this evening, uh, I'm going to spend most of my time asking uh, uh, Charles questions, uh, but sort of in the manner of Charlie Rose, so that I'll probably do more than 50% of the talking. <laughs> and. Uh, um, but if Charles wants to turn it around and, and put questions to me, I'll try to uh, answer them. We're going to do this for maybe 40 minutes, and then we're going to start taking questions from you in the audience, as well as the uh, audience uh, watching this, uh, this event uh, uh, remotely. I think there are cue cards uh, that have been handed out. Uh, so if you have, if, as questions occur to you, write them down, and I think someone will come, come down uh, the aisles and uh, collect those questions, and questions will also be um, emailed. So hopefully we'll be able to have a conversation that includes people from uh, the 14 uh, other locations, including this one. I wanted to start off this evening uh, by asking you, Charles, uh, if you could sort of solve this uh, mystery that has been puzzling me for um, a period of time. And uh, it's more or less, it goes like this. On the one hand, uh, we are told uh, that 9-11 uh, was a Mossad-engineered operation. This is a common uh, belief in much of the Arab and Muslim world. On the other hand, on 9-11, it's indisputable that hundreds of thousands of Muslims, maybe millions, uh, received the news of the attacks with considerable joy. On the one hand, we're told that the Holocaust is a myth. On the other hand, there is a great deal of literature in the Arab world which um, celebrates the Nazis and Adolf Hitler for the achievement, if you will, of uh, murdering uh, so many Jews. On the one hand, we're told that Jews are to be vilified because they killed Christ. On the other hand, it's my understanding that in Islamic theology, uh, Christ was never, in fact, uh, crucified. So these sort of weird uh, contradictions kind of conjure an image in my mind of of a kind of pervasive anti-Semitism, but also uh, an incompetent one. Uh, so what, what am I missing in, in this picture? Right, well, I'm not sure how incompetent he is. Um, I think this is something that we in the West, intellectuals and human rights activists and uh, scholars and journalists have kind of neglected to really get a grasp of. And I think when 9-11 occurred and, and this notion, I think in Egypt it was 90 odd percent of the population believed that Mossad was behind the bombing of the World Trade Center. It's, they're actually pro-Israeli. Let's go ahead. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, 
Um, that this, I think, it, it's, it's um, I think Charles Hill is a professor at Yale University. He speaks about how um, when, when societies start to believe in conspiracy theories, that there's a correlation between conspiracy theories and the ending of a civilization. And the ending, once the rationality is d dissolves, so does the civilization. So I think what's happening is very troubling. And I think it points to um, a very real social movement that's occurring, occurring throughout much of the Middle East and certainly in Iran and in Palestine and in parts of Lebanon and other parts of the Middle East. Uh, tragically, we saw some of the, the, s the problems uh, or the, uh, the uh, outgrowth of this type of anti-Semitism last week in Mumbai that there's, there's um, a distrust of the West, there's a, a view of anti-Semitism which is now permeating not just in the margins of society, but entering into mainstream society in many countries that is driven by an anti-Semitism that is based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. So these notions of conspiracy theories which we dismiss in the West, and we've dismissed in the West for many decades since the end of the Holocaust, is now resonating in the Middle East, and I think that you start to see these type of uh, notions and events occurring throughout much of the world. Now, you mentioned the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and my understanding is that it was translated into Arabic as far back as uh, 1925. It mm -hmm. originally emerged in the late 19th century, early uh, uh, 20th century. Are we to understand that um, contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism, and just to be clear here, because there's a degree of ant obfuscation when we use the term anti-Semitism, I sometimes get these weirdly anti-Semitic emails which say, how can, you know, how can, you, how can this be anti-Semitic because Arabs too are Semites. So we're talking about anti-Semitism as the term was coined by Wilhelm Marr in the late uh, 19th century. We're talking about Jew hatred here, just, uh, just to be clear on, on that point. But uh, is, is this simply something that was imported from the West? Or did it have uh, roots all its own uh, in, in the Middle East prior to uh, the early 20th century? So actually, uh, so I, would I would quote Bassam Tibi, who's now visiting in our center at Yale. Bassam Tibi is a professor from Germany, and he's an expert on Islam, and he's, an enter and he's now writing a lot on anti-Semitism or Jew hatred uh, and Islamicism. So I think there's, there's two points. I think when we refer to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that's definitely sort of a European forgery and myth that had a profound effect in European anti-Semitism. It helped pave the way for the Holocaust and had a profound effect. Um, today, in countries like Turkey, Turkey has 12 major publishing houses publishing the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. You can pick it up not only in the streets of London and the streets of New York, you can pick it up in uh, many places in the Middle East. It's now the second most published book in many Middle Eastern countries. After? After the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's now, it's not operating on the margins anymore. If uh, people go to uh, memory.org, the memory website, M-E-M-R-I, it's the Middle East um, uh, Research Institute uh, that's uh, run by Yigal Karman. They're, they're, they're showing clips, for example, that in last uh, Ramadan, there was a 40-part series on Egyptian television and Syrian television depicting stories based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. If you read the Hamas charter, now the Hamas organization, which is funded by Iran um, and supported by Iran, is a, an, an Islamicist organization which is dedicated to the, not only the eradication of the state of Israel, it's dedicated to the eradication of influences, Western influences and Jewish influences and Christian influences in the Middle East or in the Islamic world. And if you go and you Google the Hamas charter, tonight it'll take you 15 minutes to read the charter. It's literally based, the theme, the foundation of the charter of Hamas is based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. You can see it, the themes sort of uh, interwoven throughout the charter. And this is not uh, a policy of Hamas, this is the founding document of Hamas, and it's based on a Western European forgery of, of uh, genocidal anti-Semitism. So there's something happening in the Middle East, uh, in the Islamic world, which is troubling. It's now entering from the margins to the mainstream. And then I, I would go back to the question, the difference between Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. I think that this notion that many people who are not educated on the issue of anti-Semitism say that uh, Muslims can't be anti-Semitic because they're Semitic and how can people hate themselves? Well, people can hate themselves, that's first of all. 
And secondly, anti-Semitism refers to a form of Jew hatred that is European, that's European and genocidal. And it, I would say it's true that there's anti-Semitism today in the Middle East and the Islamic world, but I would say before anti-Semitism, before the European form of Jew hatred entered or penetrated into the Middle East, you have different forms of, uh, of segregation, of uh, hatred against Jews through Islamic history. And I think that um, many people try to paint a glorious or, or a rosy picture of the past. It was, if you compare, I think, Islamic treatment of Jews compared to European Christian treatment of Jews, it was obviously better in the Middle East, but it wasn't rosy. And um, we can speak to that later, particularly as it relates to Shiites. But, well, let me interrupt you right there, because there is a kind of standard view that um, the history of Jews in Muslim lands was a pretty good one, at least compared to Jews in Christian ones, that if you were a Jew in, say, 13th century Europe, you'd rather be on the Muslim side of the divide uh, than on the uh, Christian one. Have we been sort of um, politically correct and selective in, in that picture? I mean, is, is most of Islamic history usually benign when it comes to uh, the treatment of Jews with some exceptions, or is it usually not benign with a few sort of golden ages in, in uh, Andalusia and, uh, uh, you know, maybe Cairo, Baghdad at certain in certain periods of history? Well, I think it's important to say that compared to European uh, history, it can't get much worse. And that's not to say that what happened in Islamic countries is is it's not rosy, I don't think. I think there were rosy moments and, and moments during the Moorish Empire and other places you mentioned that there were good relations and, and the coming together of philosophers and thinkers and uh, people creating together and uh, creating a society that was open and tolerant. But there are instances in which, and I think traditionally that Jews were second-class citizens, they were protected, they were considered dhimmi in, mo in most instances. So they didn't have the full rights as Muslims and that sort of thing. So they were protected, but they were second class. Um, and then I think if you, if you look at this whole situation with Iran now, Iran and Iran's nuclear program and Iran's threatening of Israel and threatening to commit uh, uh, wiping Israel off the map, as uh, Ahmadinejad said, or as the Imam said. Uh, Ahmadinejad was quoting the Imam. Um, that this type of anti-Semitism is not just based on a hatred against Zionism or a hatred against Israel or, or an attempt to destroy the state of Israel. It's also based on an old sort of Shiite um, notion of Jews and the place of Jews in Iranian or Persian society. And there is a, there is a tradition. There were, there were religious rulings that were passed that shows that uh, Jews were not only second-class citizens, but they were impure. And there's a whole bunch of religious uh, rulings, and Daniel Tzadik is somewhere in the audience who's a scholar now at Yeshiva University who writes about this very well and very importantly, and how Jews were impure in, in Shia tradition. So there's a whole sort of religious rulings, for example, in, in Persia about if Jews were impure, uh, they weren't allowed to go out into the rain, because if it rains, the impurity will be washed into the public sphere. So Jews were banned from going outside during rain. And there's a whole sort of, it's almost like Talmudic discourse about, you know, if a Jew is stuck in the rain and if the clothes of the, of the Jew becomes uh, permeated with water and the water starts to drip on the, on, the, on the pavement, you know, what do you do with the pavement? So there's a whole religious rulings about what do you do with the pavement of the gar dripping garments of Jews and that sort of thing. So they would actually, they actually ruled, there were fatwa rulings that the when was this? The, uh, I believe around the 1700s. This is before the Zionist movement. So they would have to dig up the pavement and dispose of it. So you have these traditions. I recently heard of a, a woman who moved to the United States from Tehran. She's a Jewish woman uh, who lived in Tehran and had very good neighbors uh, next door to her. And one day their telephone broke, the Jewish woman's telephone broke, and she went to her long, uh, long-standing neighbor and they had good relations and she said she would like to use the phone to phone her father to say that they're home, but the phone is broken. And the woman said, of course, use the phone. She phoned her father, said we're home, the phone is broken, but everything's okay. Uh, the next day, the Jewish woman met the servant or the, the uh, cleaning woman of the Muslim household, and the cleaning woman informed the Jewish woman that the owners of the house made them take apart the phone and wash it with alcohol 15 times. 
So because she was impure and she touched the phone. So there's, there's levels of impurity, notions of impurity that are now being fused with A, the protocols and sort of European notions of anti-Semitism and also the antagonisms they have towards the state of Israel. And I, I should say that the antagonisms to the state of Israel from a Islamic or an Islamist perspective, as, as you know, is also based uh, strongly on the notion that, that the other, the, uh, pr particularly the impure other, cannot have self-determination on what they consider to be Islamic land. And the state of Israel and the Jewish people are the only other people to have self-determination in the Middle East as we speak. So part of the antagonism to Israel is not just about boundaries, but it's sort of a religious-based notion of groups of people who are considered to be impure having self-determination on what they consider to be entirely Islamic land. Well, I read something contradictory in my favorite book, The Israel Lobby, um, by uh, uh, Steve Walt and John Mearsheimer, saying that, uh, I mean, what we're really dealing with in terms of um, a Muslim hatred of uh, Israel is anti-Zionism, and that to the extent that it is colored by anti-Semitism, that in a sense is sort of ancillary uh, to, uh, to the basic uh, uh, issue. What you seem to be suggesting is precisely the opposite, that it is anti-Semitism, that it, anti-Zionism here is in effect the child uh, and, and the very beloved child of anti-Semitism. Is that right? Well, I think for Walton Mershammer, he was recently at Yale, and I must say I wasn't very impressed with him. Some, That's some, amazing. Some detractors, of, uh, no, some detractors of Israel are intelligent scholars, but uh, I don't agree with them, but he wasn't very impressive. And I would say to Walton Mershammer, there has to be context, and there's no context. There's no analysis of Middle Eastern societies and the antagonism to, to Israel of, of the Middle Eastern countries that uh, Israel surrounded or neighbors. So, th so that would be point number one. So I, I would say as a scholar that Mersheimer and Walt would have to really try to analyze the history and the society and the ideology and the values <coughs> of the neighbors of Israel and, and, and of Iran. And they, and they don't demonstrate that. In addition to their, their views, I think, of the American Jewish community and their role in Washington and their alliances to certain groups in Israel is extraordinarily problematic. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Iran. Um, the, uh, the case is made, or can be made, that when we speak about the genocidal intentions of the Iranians, um, what we're really doing is fueling a certain kind of Jewish hysteria and a very unhelpful hysteria. And in fact, what we're really doing is the bidding of, say, the Likud uh, in, in Israel that the Iranians want a bomb for um, a set of perfectly identifiable reasons, the same reasons why the Indians wanted a bomb, the Pakistanis wanted a bomb. In fact, the Israelis themselves wanted a bomb, protection, prestige, and so on, that they would be fools to use that bomb, certainly against Israel, knowing what, what the consequences uh, would be, um, and that to risk a war for the sake of stopping it is, is crazy. I mean, or it's, it's, it's crazy except if you're a mad dog uh, Likudnik or one of their mm. neocon pals in, 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 in the US. I mean, do you, what, how, how, do you, how do you view that argument? Because this is an argument that, that's heard you know, in, in respectable places. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll give some personal context. I'm coming from this. My background is one of a human rights activist. I was the chairperson of the African National Congress Solidarity, Solidarity Committee of Canada. Um, we worked with the African National Congress, the ANC, to try and abolish apartheid. I worked with indigenous groups in Canada. Um, I was part of uh, all sorts of human rights organizations from an array of issues. I'm not coming from a parochial or a neocon perspective to these issues. And I'm coming, I guess, as a social democrat uh, and a critical social theorist. And I think that as somebody who believes in human rights, um, somebody who believes in liberal democracy, somebody who believes in citizenship, somebody who believes in uh, women's rights, gay rights, religious pluralism, and certainly I'm opposed to genocidal anti-Semitism, that if anybody believes in this notion of enlightenment, democracy, and that everybody should be equal under the law, 
Iran and Islamicism poses a tremendous threat, whether you're on the left or on the right, whether you, you, regardless of your religious and cultural background, this is an affront to everybody. And what concerns me is that we in the West, I don't think we understand the language of what we hear. When Ahmadinejad spoke at uh, Columbia University last year, when he was here to speak at the United Nations, he said in his speech that uh, there are no gay people in Iran, and, and, and everybody laughed. And this was the most educated, I guess, um, example of American, the American population. You have some of the finest students and the finest faculty in that room, and everybody laughed when he said there were no gay people in Iran. And I think if you understand the human rights violations against gay people in Iran, nobody ought to laugh. And what Ahmadinejad is not a stupid man, and he's a very smart and clever man. And what he meant was, you cannot be gay in Iran. And if you're found out to be gay in Iran, it's punishable by death. Because according to radical notions of Islamicism, it's just not tolerated. Just like it's not tolerated for Jewish people to have self-determination on what he considers to be Islamic land. So I really would argue strongly that regardless of our political backgrounds here in this room, that we really need to start to listen to the language and to understand the language and educate ourselves about what is being said. Because one thing about the Islamicists is that they're straightforward, they're clear, they make they, they don't uh, hide their agenda. Every Friday in the mosques, every policy paper they write, they're very clear and straightforward. And we need to really begin to read and understand and educate ourselves in what they're doing. But when Ahmadinejad talks about Zionism, he's usually very specific. I mean, it's about the Zionists. Mm -hmm. what, what is your evidence that he is, that this also is about Jews? Or does it matter? Well, I think uh, when he came to the United Nations last time, uh, six weeks or so ago, and the financial crisis was breaking, he spoke about the Zionists, but he also spoke in the, in the spirit of the protocols of the elders of Zion. He spoke about a small group of people in New York City controlling economies and being corrupt, and he was speaking very clearly about Jews and world domination of Jews and their alliance to, to Zionists. Um, Ahmadinejad, and I have quotes, all sorts of quotes with me here, speaks of the Zionist entity, but he also speaks of Israel, and he also speaks of Jews. And Ras Anjani, for example, I'm sure as you know, uh, not too long ago, when uh, one of the people in the government said that we don't have a problem with the Jewish people, we only have a problem with Zionism in Israel, Ras Anjani said very clear that we also have a problem with Jews. And it goes back, I think, to the religious notion that Jews cannot have self-determination on Islamic land. It's an affront to this Islamicist notion of recreating or creating a caliphate and doing away with a foreign entity, i.e. the Jews under the state of Israel. But uh, I guess what, what I'm wondering is that, I mean, you, you seem to be painting a picture in which it's really impossible to extirpate the anti-Semitic component from Islam itself. Or are you simply mm -hmm. talking about the Rafsanjanis and the, on the Sunni side, the Yusuf Karadawis, the more extreme theologians. Yeah, I would say the more extreme theologians. That um, although Karadawi is considered a mainstream. Sure, uh, but, I, but I would say there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and there's different traditions and different perspectives and different uh, schools of thought and cultural traditions. And I don't think that it's a problem with Islam, although some people are suggesting it. I I, I don't agree. Um, but there is a problem with Islamicism. And I, I come from a sort of social theory perspective on this. And the work of Emmanuel Levinas, if anybody knows, Levinas was a Jewish philosopher who came from Lithuania, and he went to France to study. And while he was in France studying, his family was wiped out uh, during the Holocaust. And he spent his entire philosophical career bringing Jewish ethics, from, uh, mostly from Pirkei Avot, from the Talmud, and infusing it into Western philosophy. And his most important contribution was the whole notion of the other and respecting the other. And he said we truly become human when we see in the face of the other, we see ourselves in the face of the other. This is when we're human. And so Levinas, the work of people uh, who work on multiculturalism like Charles Taylor and Michael Walzer, Will Kimlicka, the notion of diversity and acceptance is all about recognizing the other and creating social democracies and creating human rights based on recognizing the other and creating a society to, to, together with each other. When we are faced with a group of people who want to commit genocide, literally, 
They, they, they explicitly say this over and over. Recently, Ahmadinejad spoke about how, how Israel, not the Zionists, but Israel was a, a germ, a bacteria that had to be eradicated from the region. And this is language that we know too well is reflective of, uh, of the Nazi movement and that sort of thing. That when people want to clearly commit a genocide, there is a moral and ethical obligation for people to stop it. And there's no, I don't see how you, you discuss and, and you can talk all you want, but there's no way that if somebody wants to exterminate another group that there's anything to talk about unless we become part and parcel of their project, which I, I assure, I'm sure that, not pe that people don't want to do this. Well, I mean, programmatically, this would mean, for example, no peace process. No peace process with the Iranians. Well, or negotiations with the Iranians. What about a peace process in Israel between the Israelis and whatever the next Palestinian government may be, or with the Syrians who espouse a similar kind of mentality? I mean, is that what you're actually suggesting? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a military expert, and I'm not a strategic expert, but from a social theoretical, from a, from a philosophical perspective, if a group of people want to exterminate another group of people, there's nothing to negotiate. Maybe, maybe there could be ceasefires, whatever, but when this ideology s explicitly states the, they want to eradicate Jewish people or gay people, I don't think as Western people who believe in human rights, democracy, uh, the rule of law, that there's much to talk about. There's not much room for maneuver. Well, look, I mean, you identified yourself uh, a few minutes ago as a, as a social democrat. Um, and it does seem to me, uh, and I'm not a social democrat, uh, but it does seem to me that as a social democrat, you, your, your problem is particularly acute. Because to the extent that sort of pro-Palestinian discourse is heard in prominent places in this country, it tends to be identified with uh, the left. To the extent that Israel comes in for repeated and withering criticism as a colonizer, as an occupier, as an aggressor, most of that language tends to come from what you might call progressive quarters. And I think uncomfortably for many Jews, a lot of the support that Israel gets comes from the very folks that for um, generations, Jews have been pretty suspicious of. That's to say, uh, uh, the Christian right. So, I mean, it's, it, it sounds to me, I mean, well, first of all, I guess my first question is, how do you account for that? How do you account for the fact that the left, the group that advocates multiculturalism, mm -hmm. respect for the other, respect for gay rights, respect for women's rights, a whole panoply of, of rights traditionally associated with voices on the left is now the same group that tends more often to be critical of Israel. Why did that happen? I think it happened for many reasons. I think that there's a, uh, as a person who I guess identify with the, the, the political agenda of the left in many ways, and I think I still do, um, when it comes to anti-Semitism on the left, there's a serious problem. And I think it's a problem that people are beginning to grapple with. Uh, there's groups of people in Europe, leftist intellectuals who are fighting anti-Semitism on the left, from the left. So there's the beginning of, of some movement. And I would say that's also not only is anti-Semitism. You're talking about people like Bernard Henri. Bernard Henri Levy, uh, sociologists and scholars in London, like the Engage people, and there's a few that mm -hmm. are, are beginning to to deal with this very serious issue. Uh, Levy just came out with a book. Uh, I believe it's called The Left in Dark Times, which I, I, I would recommend strongly for people to read. Um, that there's not only an, a problem of anti-Semitism on the left, I think there's a problem of racism on the left. And, and I think for the left to be blindly pro-Palestinian has led to a catastrophe. Because if you're, if you're concerned about a left-wing, social democratic, human rights agenda in Palestine, it's been a complete failure. And I think that the left has been unable, I would say because of racism, to cr be critical of the Palestinian social movement uh, for the last several decades. What's that racist component? I think it's almost sort of this orientalist exotification of the Palestinians, of, of Arabs, that uh, these are people who belong to a culture that are not quite capable of li living up to our standards of human rights and decency, and they've allowed reactionary movements to take over uncritically. These are, as we know, Hamas and Hezbollah have 
taken over societies which not only are genocidal in their anti-Semitism and homophobic, but are squashing uh, any sort of democratic process within the Palestinian Authority. They're, they're very suspicious of secular and moderate Muslims, and they're giving them a hard time. Um, and yet the left in the West has been largely silent. So I think it's a combination of racism and anti-Semitism. And I think some of the racism, too, um, is part of a colonial hangover, um, the Orientalist sort of view of the Middle East. And it also comes from, uh, I think, an anti-Western, anti-American agenda that after the Second World War, after the Holocaust, um, as states became decolonized and countries became independent, the left became, I think, critical of the United States as it became a superpower and influenced Western Europe. And it was also opposed to colonialism. So any sort of intervention uh, by the West in the struggles of, uh, of decolonizing people, and the Palestinians being one and the slowest evolution, uh, evolving one, um, that they didn't want to be intervene critically. And I think they should have intervened critically let many me put, times. Let me put a theory to you that um, I've been thinking about actually for a number of years. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the story of how it, it sort of uh, emerged for me. I was, when I was the editor of the Jerusalem Post, I uh, had a chance to um, interview the fellow whose name escapes me, but he was then the EU ambassador, the European Commission's ambassador to Israel. And I said, why is it that we hear nonstop from the European Union that the, that the Israel has to end its occupation of the West Bank, of Gaza, but we never hear from the European Union that Syria has to end its occupation of Lebanon? Why is it that when 53 Palestinians are killed in Janine, it is a major event in European politics, um, but when 50,000 people are killed in Darfur, it is a comparatively minor event. I offered a few instances of that. And he said something that stayed with me. He said, you see, you Israelis, including me as an Israeli, um, you Israelis, you're one of us. Our expectations are higher for you than they are for, say, Cambodians or Colombians. It was, I remember being really very struck by the comment. First of all, um, the racism involved vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Cambodians or Colombians. But I also thought what was, what was telling about the comment was the idea that more is expected of Jews. Um, which harks back to a comment that was once made, I think, by the, uh, the philosopher Eric Hoffer, who said that um, uh, Israelis are the only country on earth that is expected to behave like a Christian nation. Uh, now, it seems to me that something is at play here which is actually quite ancient, and I'm wondering what your take on it is. Part of the reason why Christian anti-Semitism has been so sustained, um, so powerful, is that Christ offered his dispensation first to the Jews, and he, the Jews turned him down. So I mean, it came later to the, you know, to Europe and, and the rest of the world, but the Jews were the first ones who were given this gift. and they turned it down. Then, sort of moving ahead a couple of thousand years, there were these wonderful expectations put on Israel. Do you remember Jerusalem of gold, the, the kibbutzim movement, a kind of socialist uh, paradise? And after 1967, Israel disappointed all of those um, expectations. It became more laissez-faire uh, in its economic outlook. It took over the West Bank and Gaza. It got itself involved in sort of the muck and mire of, of geopolitics. So Israel sort of had, was given the opportunity to be different, and it disappointed um, those expectations. And in a way, that's a kind of parable of the fallen angel. That's to say it's, it's satanic mm -hmm. in a sense. You don't really expect moral behavior from beasts. And if you think of, say, the Sudanese as beasts, well, you don't expect moral behavior. That's just sort of what the Sudanese do. They go and kill Darfuris, or they kill their, their southern uh, citizens, and, and so on. But more is expected of the Jews. 
Now, is that, I mean, it, does, does that, is that a crazy theory on my part? No, I think you touch on something very important. And I, I would say uh, for a, a strand of anti-Semitism always said, or always claims that, you know, only, if only the Jews would, the world would be safe. So if only Israel changed or if only Israel didn't exist, there'd be peace in the world. Um, if, when religion was the way of seeing the world, the Christians used to argue or the anti-Semitic Christians would argue that um, you know, only, if the, only if the Jews would accept Christ, everything would be okay. Uh, when race and biology and nationalism became the way of seeing the world, the Europeans were fascinated by the fact that you know, only if the Jews would be eradicated, eliminated, or removed, then everything would be okay. And I think now the strand is that if Israel would change or if Israel disappears, then everything will be okay. And I think this is why it's so important for people uh, for moderate Muslims and, and people in the West to really begin to understand the language of Islamicism because it will, what the thing about anti-Semitism and I think that the demonization of Israel and holding Israel to double standards is a form of anti-Semitism. I, I wrote on this very issue with uh, Ed Kaplan, a colleague at Yale, and we showed unequivocally that there's a, a very profound link between traditional classical anti-Semitism and what we call Israel bashing. We don't call it anti-Zionism, but extraordinarily harsh criticism of Israel is very much linked to um, traditional anti-Semitism. In fact, we found that of the people that bashed Israel excessively, they were 13 times more likely to be anti-Semitic than the average population in 10 European countries. So it, it's off the charts. Um, so, so there is this belief that if only Israel changes or only if Israel is gone, that everything will be okay. But the thing about anti-Semitism and Israel bashing is that anti-Semitism it, it start, anti starts with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. And, and Europe and, and nations in which got rid of its Jews always, always end up in, in, in dire straits and other people, many other people, are often caught in, in this cancerous... Could you say, uh, just to interrupt you briefly, sure. anti-Zionism starts with Zionists but never ends with Zionists? Mm. So to say... Well, the, 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 yeah. It ends with, it, from anti-Zionism, right. you get anti-Semitism, and then you get... Right. Uh, right. So, and I, you know, so the whole sort of notion of uh, when this thing happened in Janine, I remember watching CNN, and they were, call, they were calling, you know, Janine was a holocaust, literally. Um, the Palestinian public spokesperson, Arakat, and others were calling it a holocaust. It turned out that 53 people died. The vast majority of the people who died were combatants uh, fighting, engaged in the Israeli engaging with the IDF. Um, there's this type of imagery, there's the Nazification of Israel that's occurring, and there's also Holocaust denial, which is rampant in, in the Middle East, and it's also uh, re-emerging in, in Europe and other parts of the West. And in a sense, Holocaust denial is repugnant because on, it, it's almost sort of, it's committing another Holocaust on the memory of the Jewish people. So when Ahmadinejad and the Islamicists uh, claim that the, the Jews are swindling money from the Europeans uh, from reparations and this is just sort of a conspiracy to create the state of Israel and that the Israelis and the Jews are, are swindling Europeans. This is just an, an eradication of the, the memory of the Jewish people and using the Holocaust as a weapon to fight the state of Israel and the Jewish people. So it, it, it's, it's a nasty uh, form of anti-Semitism. So, I mean, since uh, I think we've managed to depress everyone in the <laughs> audience totally, uh, what, what do we what do we do about this? What we do about it, I think, you know, um, Elie Wiesel was at Yale last year, and um, he spoke at the law school, and it was a packed audience. And Elie Wiesel spoke about how the suicide bomber was being elevated to a national level, i.e., uh, with Iran and that he was uh, extraordinarily worried about the possibility of another Holocaust. And for me and for, 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 for some of my colleagues watching Elie Wiesel, who's not only the symbol of a survivor of the Holocaust, but also I think he's a wise uh, man, scholar, intellectual in the, in, in the greatest tradition of some of the Hasidic rabbis, and he's a man that worked for human rights uh, all over the world trying to narrow the gap between being a bystander and watching injustice. I think he's an extraordinary man. And here he was, a survivor, talking about the possibility in his lifetime of another Holocaust, of Israel being hit by a nuclear bomb. 
And he went on to say, and it was very disturbing to see him speak about this, and then he went on to say that the thing that really disturbs him, the thing that really bothers him, is that nobody is doing anything. And that, that the Jewish community, Western leaders, academics, scholars, the human rights community, has really been silent on this issue. And it was an extraordinary moment at the law school to hear Elie Wiesel say this uh, for me. I had a similar conversation with Natan Sharansky also about a year ago in Israel. Uh, I was part of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry and in 1984 I was in Moscow visiting his, I met his family and he was in solitary confinement on a hunger strike at the time. And he said that when he was on the hunger strike he knew that one day he'd be free in Jerusalem. And he knew he'd be free in Jerusalem in his lifetime because as he put it, the students of Western Europe and North America and the Jewish housewives were on the streets marching. And he also said, Charles, why is nobody doing anything in the United States, in Canada, and Western Europe on this issue? And this is an issue that not only confronts Israel and the Jewish people, it, it's an affront to everything that people believe in in terms of human rights and liberal social democracy. So I would say that we need to educate ourselves on the language of Islamicism, what their agenda is, what they're trying to do, and to start to, in every way we can, from writing our politicians to writing op-ed pieces to educating our classes to educating our community to, to begin to create a program to, to confront this issue, which I believe is the most serious issue confronting the Jewish people and Western democracy in our lifetime. And it seems to me, I mean, I agree with what you say, but it seems to me that a lot of the... Um, a lot of our thinking about this matter is clouded because we say the answer to the Ahmadinejads of the world is tolerance. And in fact, on the anniversary of Kristallnacht, it was just uh, the 70th anniversary um, uh, three weeks ago, uh, the European uh, Parliament hosted a meeting of European Jewish leaders who actually met with um, some uh, representatives from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, a number of other uh, uh, Muslim countries. And they were going to agree to this, uh, what they call a white paper, on uh, combating uh, anti-Semitism and racism and other forms of intolerance, which on the, on the surface sounded like it was a real breakthrough. Now, at the same time that this was happening, the UN General Assembly is debating a resolution that would urge um, the uh, urge defamation of religion as a punishable or taboo uh, activity. It would prescribe it. Now, it seemed to me that under the banner of tolerance, all kinds of things could happen. One of the things that could happen is that the conversation that you and I have just been having could be banned because we are speaking about Islam or at least Islamism in ways that some Islamists might take offense to. Say we are defaming their religion and there might even be a UN General Assembly resolution to back them. And that's hugely uh, uh, worrisome. We have to have kind of open conversations about what is happening with Hamas, with Iran, um, among Muslim scholars in a way that is un, uh, unblinkered and uh, where you can sort of have these, um, have these kinds of conversations. I mean, tolerance seems to me a very weak rubric under which to, to fight this particular battle. In fact, intolerance is probably a much better one. You have to define the boundaries of what is acceptable and what is not what hatreds nobody will stand for, who is considered kind of outside the realm of civilized uh, conversation and isn't worth talking to. In that sense, I was very troubled by Ahmadinejad's invitation to Columbia University, which you mentioned. This is uh, in September of 2007, which is to say that everyone is, in effect, admitted to the court of um, public opinion. Everyone can have his soapbox mm -hmm. for a day, particularly if that everyone happens to be a country of a, uh, the president of, a, of, of an important country. Now this isn't, I don't think, 
the kind of thing that Columbia would have extended, I hope, to a David Duke or to a Louis Farrakhan or to any number of race baiters and anti-Semites because we do recognize that some people really should fall outside of people we consider worth listening to. And when you're a guardian of culture, as it were, when you're an editor of a newspaper or a magazine, or you're the president or dean of a university, you get to say who is worth listening to and who isn't. And if Ahmadinejad wants to give a speech, there is probably a corner on Broadway where he can, uh, where he can offer his, uh, his thoughts. I think that is part of the issue that we face today. We think that the answer to intolerance is more tolerance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the answer to intolerance is being intolerant right back. Um, with that, uh, I think, are we, are we ready for questions? I'm sort of looking out on a dim uh, screen here. Here we go, and the questions, please. Okay, well, why don't we go straight to Omaha? I've, I think I've spent my entire life wanting to say that. Let's go straight to a question from Omaha. Uh, and the question is, following the terrorist attack in Mumbai, what inferences or observations can you draw or make that our new president will have to address? That's a good question. Um, and I think it relates to your last statement, that um, we can't just tolerate for the sake of toleration. That um, toleration is actually a very important component of liberal democracy, and liberal democracy is based on certain values. So we have to tolerate the other, uh, but we have to tolerate the other, minorities and other cultures and other ways of life, within a context of the rule of law, of equality, of citizenship, and, and so on. So when groups of people are dedicated to the eradication of part of the population, the eradication of democracy and the rule of law, we have to defend our values and our principles and we have to, I think at some level, become re-educated and, and relearn what values we have and what this society and what other Western societies and notions of democracy is about. Um, the, 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 the rampage, the horrific rampage that took place in Mumbai, um, just the, the, the inhumanity that was demonstrated is um, profound. And um, the killing of anybody who is perceived not to be a certain type of Muslim uh, was carried out in, in, in a way that is so inhumane, I, I, can't, I can't describe it. Um, and this should not be tolerated. And, and this, this has to be eradicated. And I hope that the new administration um, will take this seriously. I, I, I believe that they will. I hope that they will. Um, but it's going to be a tremendous uh, challenge. And I think that it's going to stress, stretch the, um, the resources and the efforts of, of the United States and other Western countries to take this on. And not only Western countries, but I would say to even save uh, countries or nation states that have been allied allies or to some extent allies of the West. That Pakistan, for example, is really in a position now where it could disintegrate. Here you have a nuclear power um, that can, the, the state can disintegrate and be taken over by radical Islamists bent on, on killing people at a large scale as we've seen in Mumbai, but to, to elevate it to a level of a state level would be a, a disaster. You know, um, if I can just sort of add a, a, a few sentences there. Uh, um, President-elect Obama uh, was introducing his foreign policy team uh, this morning in Chicago and he made a comment uh, quoting Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense, saying that Afghanistan is where this war on terror was begun and, and it's where it will end. I think that's, um, that's not a particularly um, uh, apposite, um, useful statement. Um, the war on terror began in Afghanistan only incidentally because 9-11 took place at a time when Osama bin Laden happened to be in Afghanistan enjoying sanctuary for the, from the Taliban and not, say, five years earlier when he was in Sudan 
enjoying sanctuary from the Sudanese government. It's entirely conceivable now that Somalia seems to be on the verge of tipping over back into the hands of the Islamists that we could discover that Somalia, which already is creating this piracy problem for us, could become a new haven. Mm -hmm. Terrorism is global, and what we saw in Mumbai is that um, these atrocities really can happen anywhere, and they're coming sometimes from uh, training camps in the northwest frontier province where we uh, suspect uh, uh, bin Laden is and Zawahiri is, but in this case the lashkar e toiba uh, terrorist camp uh, seems to have been uh, somewhere in the Punjab, that is to say really in, in uh, the Pakistani heartland itself. So it's a mistake to think of this war in effect geographically. That seems to be a very 19th or a very 20th century way of looking at, the, uh, looking at the war. This is particularly so when terrorists are every bit as um, mobile and as technologically adept as we are. One of the scenes that I found most striking from the Mumbai attacks was a, one of the attackers, one of the terrorists, using a Blackberry. And just as I am addicted to that machine, uh, so were they. And that demonstrates a kind of networked quality to the problem. It shows that the problem is as extant in Amsterdam or The Hague as it is in Java or um, Bali. And so it's a mistake to conceive of the war um, in a fundamentally geographic way. This isn't World War II where we know that the moment the Russians take Berlin, Hitler and fascism collapse. We took, we took Kabul. Um, and conceivably, we could even take Islamabad and not resolve the problem. The problem is ideological, mm -hmm. and that ideology is spread and helped um, through uh, the, use of, the use of sophisticated technology. So I think that's a point that the next president needs to take into account as he, as he thinks this through. Um, let us go to, uh, let's see, um, here, question from Atlanta. Are you suggesting that traditional notions of deterrence will not work with Iran, that what prevented Russia, China, and North Korea from using nuclear weapons will not work in this case? It's another good question. I, I would say that it's, um, Iran poses a new uh, type of threat. I think they would be the first country that in a way doesn't operate only in the material world. I think the, the Soviet Union, the United States, Western countries, you know, communist, capitalist, socialist, our materialist uh, worldviews, they, they um, have similar geopolitical worldviews. They try to control resources and land and maximize that sort of uh, power base. Here with Iran, if Iran had the bomb, it would be the first country in the history of warfare to have a nuclear device that is also operating in, in a theocratic level, but also operating at a, at a, at a non-material or non-rational level. They speak about you know, martyrs, they speak about virgins, they speak about, for example, Ahmadinejad speaks about the missing imam. Um, if people don't know, the, the missing imam is supposed to return shortly. Uh, Ahmadinejad is part of a group of people that want to usher in the returning of the sort of messianic figure of the 12th imam. Um, and Ahmadinejad, when he spoke at the United Nations in 2007, writes about how he was bathed in green light and for 27 or 28 minutes the world leaders looked at him without blinking and that this was the the workings of the imam and that the imam is coming. Ahmadinejad and his government are rebuilding mosques for the missing imam to reappear and many accounts show that Ahmadinejad thinks he's the, he's the individual mentioned in the Quran or mentioned in this Shiite myth of the returning imam he's the individual that will be the catalyst for the imam to return, that he's the sort of messianic assistant to the returning imam. So these are people who believe in a, a realm that uh, most of us don't. And if these people have the bomb, um, I think it's an extraordinarily dangerous situation that cannot be allowed to happen. That if it, if it happens, if they get the device, and as we know a few weeks ago, the New York Times reported that they now have enough material, they may not have the technological know-how to put it together, but they have enough nuclear material to begin processes which would give them a, a nuclear weapon. That's so another milestone has been passed. And I think as these milestones pass, um, the price of stopping Iran, and I think Iran must be stopped to avoid this catastrophe, 
the price gets higher and higher. So I hope the new government will, will take this situation extraordinarily seriously. Well, the only thing I would add there, I think there is a mistake in becoming too focused on Ahmadinejad. There's an election coming up in May yes. in Iran, and um, I once was chatting with an Israeli uh, uh, who said, look, Ahmadinejad has been, um, I mean, he's practically a Mossad agent. He gives Iran such a bad name that it's very hard to blink, whereas um, previously with Khatami, um, there was real engagement with uh, the Iranians. He presented a very pleasant face to that regime, yet it was under Khatami that we know that the Iranians were in fact secretly uh, moving full steam ahead with, uh, uh, with, with secret uh, uh, nuclear programs. So there's a danger in personalizing this, and the Iranians are certainly not stupid. Uh, they, and I think they understand that Ahmadinejad has been, uh, has, been uh, uh, has given Iran uh, an image that they might not desire. On the other hand, he's also performed a service for them because, in a sense, he's sort of mo he's he's what Daniel Patrick Moynihan once talked about defining deviancy down. Um, we used to think of Rafsanjani as about as hard line as you could get in Iran, but ever since Ahmadinejad came around, we say, well, we could you know hopefully hope we could hope for a, a pragmatic moderate like Rafsanjani. You actually hear that being said. Well, he Rafsanjani only appears like a pragmatic moderate in comparison to uh, Ahmadinejad. Yeah, so I, would yeah I, I think that's very important. I would just add that it's the Ayatollahs that ultimately have the power. And I think regardless if a liberal or an Ahmadinejad type of character is in power, it, we really need to understand the worldview of the Ayatollahs who are controlling uh, the Iranian government uh, very strongly. Question from the audience here in New York. And I'm going to answer it, if you don't mind. Um, do you believe that Israel should destroy Iran's nuclear potential before they develop a bomb? And if not, what alternative uh, is there? Um, the answer is yes to both, uh, and, and, and in, in the following sense. Look, uh, to whoever has asked this question, um, an, a military strike on Iran's nuclear installations would be a vastly more fraught, uh, dangerous, uh, affair than what was achieved in 1981 at Osirak or in uh, 2007 with the uh, Syrian reactor in the desert. You're talking about multiple sites, uh, well dispersed, we don't even know where uh, everything is, very well defended. It is really on the outer limits of Israel's uh, uh, capabilities to strike. And I know that some Israeli generals have said it's really not a logistical question or a military question. It's a, uh, it's a political question. That's, that's, I think, a bit of, of bravado. It would be a very difficult thing for Israel um, to do, and it could involve a major regional war. Now, would that war be worth paying if that were the only option? Uh, uh, would that be a price worth paying if that were the only option? I would argue that uh, it, would, it, it would well be, because in Iran, with a nuclear capability, is a catastrophic scenario not simply for the threat that Iran poses, but for the fact that once Iran is a nuclear weapon state, you can be certain that the Saudis, the Turks, and the Egyptians will not be far behind. Not all of those regimes are entirely stable. We have no idea what comes next. And the idea of a Middle East with five or six nuclear weapon states, where those states either have messianic complexes, or they're um, like Iran, or they're highly unstable and, and liable for an al-Qaeda takeover like Pakistan, or they're a, 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 they're a theocratic gerontocracy like uh, Saudi Arabia, or they're liable for a Muslim Brotherhood takeover like Egypt, and so on. That is not, as they say, a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, it seems to me that there are real possibilities for this administration to exercise genuine pressure on Iran that have, might have a meaningful impact on their calculations. There are two ways of thinking about what to do about an Iranian nuclear uh, weapon or I Iran's nuclear ambitions. Number one is regime change. The, you, don't, you, don't like, you don't like this, the idea of an Iranian bomb, but most of all, you don't want the, the idea of an Iranian bomb in the hands of these people. So you, you work to, to, to change the regime. And that either means everything from a kind of full-style uh, invasion, which is very implausible, to arming 
uh, various ethnic groups in Iran. Remember, Persians are less than 50% of the Iranian population. There are a whole series of uh, scenarios that could threaten the, uh, threaten the Iranians. The other alternative, and I think this is much more fruitful, is to think about regime preservation. And let me just sort of explain this, because obviously I'm not thrilled at the idea of preserving this regime. Iran wants a bomb in large part because it believes that a bomb assures its survival as, a, as, as an Islamic republic. Um, it believes it gives it prestige, freedom of maneuver in the region, uh, um, power vis-a-vis -vis the West, and so forth and so on. So the question for Western policymakers for the Obama administration becomes, how do you persuade the Iranian leaders that their regime's safety is better assured without nuclear weapons than with them. We managed to ha do this, to do the same thing with the South Africans, with the Ukrainians. This is not, this is not the first time in history that a regime has been persuaded to abandon its, uh, its nuclear ambitions. And one way of doing it is to so massively increase economic pressure on Iran, and this is a particularly vulnerable moment for them with oil prices uh, falling very sharply, and with inflation at over 50%, how do you inc so increase economic pressure on the regime that they feel more threatened from within by the possibility of a, re of a revolution? And remember, this is a regime that, came, that was swept in by a revolution. These are people who are aware how quickly these events can, can unfold and they, they could be swept out mm -hmm. by a, a revolution. How do you so exert economic pressure that they say to themselves, it's not worth it? Clearly, the UN sanctions haven't been remotely enough, but Iran is a country that imports 50% of its refined gasoline. It is within the power of the United States without resorting to bombs, without resorting to, to arming ethnic minorities or any of that to blockade those imports. And imagine if the next president comes in and says to the Iranians, you're in violation of three UN Security Council resolutions and their binding resolutions. I'm going to blockade your oil for a month. See how much you like that. After a month's time, let's l come back to the table, talk, and tell me if you're going to continue to enrich uranium at Natanz. Tell me if you're going to continue to build your plants at Iraq, Isfahan, and so on. And that would signal to the Iranian people that the problems they have, the economic problems they have, are the results of the decisions that their government is making, not the West. So. Yeah, I, agree, I agree with you, and I think just to, to add, <laughs> Um, I think in, in relation to the question, I think it's very important to realize that Israel's on the front line, number one. And I think uh, the, the Bush administration, by going to war in Afghanistan and going to war in Iraq, um, by defeating two of Iran's greatest enemies, it obviously emboldened and empowered Iran. Um, that combined with the, the report last year of the National uh, Intelligence Estimate, that um, the headline was that basically Iran was not, ha the, the, the nuclear program with Iran was not really uh, a problem anymore. Um, although if you read the, the estimate, uh, it didn't say that, but the headlines took the steam out of the boycott movement or the sanctions movement that was starting to gather a bit of momentum. So we're, I think we're at a moment now with the new administration coming in where the, the possibility of serious uh, sanctions or, or a, a naval blockade, and I, I agree that this is the Achilles heel of the Iranian economy, that a naval blockade, not even a violent military strike, could really bring the economy of Iran to its knees. But the question is, is there the political will in Europe and in North America to do so? And I'm not sure, and um, I, I hope that it will come to that. But I think that I, I would argue here that the given the history of the American involvement in the Middle East, and, and not, obviously not by design, but by result, the, the emboldening and the empowerment of Iran, I think, is a direct relation to the fact that the United States and the coalition countries defeated Iraq and defeated Afghanistan. So I would even argue that there's a moral and ethical reason, not only a military and a human rights agenda that ought to be carried out, but there's a, a moral and ethical um, argument to be made that the United States of America and the other countries owe Israel and other countries in the, the, in the region, the Sunni countries, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia are also getting very nervous with the rise of I Iran, um, that there needs to be a concert concerted effort by the United States and other countries really to stop this because part of this is, is the American government's doing. <laughs>
Um, we have uh, probably exceeded our time, but I'll ask one last question. There are a lot of, I should add, there are a lot of very good questions. So Austin, Minneapolis, Baltimore, apologies for not uh, getting to all of you. This one also is from the audience. And it says, uh, do you think that the notion of a Palestinian nation makes sense? And I guess as an academic, I'm not sure if the person intended to say nation or state, but I'll let you answer it any which way you want. Um, does it make sense? Uh, does a Palestinian uh, state make sense? N nation or state? Nation makes state. Sense. I, th I think uh, I would argue that under the right circumstances and situation, that uh, two-state solution is the only way that um, Palestinians and Israelis can move forward. I, I believe in a two-state solu solution. Um, I am worried that uh, I think Hamas is gaining strength. They took over Gaza, and by some estimates, they're on the verge or can take over the West Bank and, and remove Fatah and, and uh, Abu Mazen's uh, Fatah party. So I, I would not like to see an Islamicist uh, Palestinian entity emerge as it did in Gaza. I'd be opposed to that, and I think that should be stopped uh, uh, by, all, uh, by all means. But if a secular democratic uh, state was created in Palestine, I think that would be, or, or the West Bank in Gaza, I think that would be a, a good thing for, for everybody involved. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Charles Small, uh, Small thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs> we wish we could have answered more questions, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.